Yo, what is going on my fellow weebs? Colonel here and welcome back to the channel. So today, we're going to talk about builds in Fractured Daydream. But before we jump to that, if you're new here, as always, I'm Chrono. I primarily cover just anime games in general. Would much appreciate to subscribe as we're going towards that 10k mark, hopefully by the end of this year. I know it's going to be a bit of a stretch, we're going to have to push pretty hard, but I do have a lot of content on the horizon, and hopefully you guys will enjoy it as we move forward. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump into this. So I'm not fully leveled in Fractured Daydream. I've reached kind of what I consider like the midway point just before you hit the end game as far as building is concerned. But through playing with a bunch of friends that are fully leveled and through doing a bunch of research, looking into how people are getting their damage and looking into how it works at a bit of a lower level even, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on how builds themselves work in Fractured Daydream. And to be honest, while I personally am more of a fan of how builds work in this game than other SAO games, I will say that the process of making those builds isn't exactly as easy. So in previous SAO games, specifically what I'm thinking of as Fatal Bullet, you were able to more or less just farm a vendor for what you needed. And you could build things up very quickly. As long as you could build up enough money to fund what you needed, which was not that difficult, you were able to essentially just reset a vendor over and over again and build up some pretty powerful weapons to utilize. Now, keep in mind, you did still have to get the base weapons to then build those up, so on and so forth. However, it was pretty easy for you to get you know, get by with the different passives and all that stuff. And you really didn't focus too much on that until you reached like semi end game, really, in the leveling process. So it was something you didn't do a whole lot of very early on. In Fractured Daydream, however, you have the whole player rank system where you're leveling up from one all the way to 100. Your characters level up to 100 uh, to get more base stats and things like that and some rewards. But realistically speaking, what you're doing, you're like your whole progression process is based on your player rank. That's how you unlock specific quests and so on and so forth. Like you guys are well aware of that process. So how should you be building as you're going through the player ranks? Well, I feel like it's broken up into three phases. You have like your early game where you're just kind of blasting through levels. You're, you know, of course, going through tons and tons of gear. You're not really worried too much about the specifics to like your midway point or your mid tier where you want to somewhat pay attention, but your builds are more based on passives and trying to take advantage of those. And you're still leveling characters and still kind of figuring things out before you reach end game where you actually can make proper builds. Actually, something I enjoy a lot about Fractured Daydream over the previous games is that you can make legitimate builds as opposed to in the previous games, your builds are based mostly on like your skills. And a lot of times it defaulted into stack as many buffs as possible to do as much damage as you can and then spam every single skill you've got. Now, granted, Fractured Daydream doesn't really work like that. You are still spamming your skills, you are still taking advantage of your buffs, but it doesn't work the same way it did in, as in previous games like Alicization Licorice, Fatal Bullet, whatever. I'm trying to think of all the different games off the top of my head. Those two are the ones I played the most, by the way, which, which is Alicization Licorice and Fatal Bullet. And I mean, they also happened to like Hollow Realization and stuff like that as well. So a lot of different games, you basically ended up doing very similar stuff and you were mostly just taking advantage of stats. You wanted to get the proper stats you could get and do as much damage as possible. The cool thing I like about Fractured Daydream is kind of like its best and its worst feature, to be perfectly honest, and it's it's uh, legendary gear. So legendary gear has specialized effects that basically allow you to craft your builds. And if you take advantage of those along with passives, you can take a character that seems to do not much of anything and absolutely destroy with them. And I'm going to talk about a very generalistic build that I'll be pushing for with Kirito as reaching endgame. And then I'll talk about some more nuanced things in the mix that you can do. But like I mentioned, we're going to do this in three different phases. So let's start with phase one, which is the early game and what you should be paying attention to as you're just leveling and blasting through the player ranks. Now, when you finish the story, you should be somewhere around like player rank 15 ish, I believe, um, anywhere between like 10 to 15, if I remember correctly. So you will be getting into some of your different quests here. Now, when you're first starting off, the only thing you're really concerned about on your characters is mostly just elemental matching. Elemental matching or having the proper element on your weapon is huge in Fractured Daydream. You do a lot more damage if you're using the proper, if you're using the elemental weakness of the enemy and you don't have to guess. They just tell you flat out when you're looking at quests. If you look at co-op quests, look at Woods of, Re of Recollection, we can see that the enemy or the boss enemy is weak to electric. So as long as you use an electric weapon, you're going to crush this enemy. This usually tends to be the case with the enemies that are in the zone as well, as well as the elites. Now, it doesn't always work out to be that way. It's not like a perfect system where this is always the case, but it's mostly similar to this process where you're going to find that you do tend to have enemies that are weak to the same element as the boss is weak to. 
like I said, the most important thing is making sure that you're able to crush the boss and most of the elites anyway. So as long as you're following that, you're pretty much good to go. Outside of that, realistically speaking, as far as accessories go, you can just slot on whatever the highest level accessory is you have. Accessories realistically only give you base HP. So, I mean, their main stat is base HP. Of course, they have special effects, but their main stat is base HP. That's what you're mostly concerned with. You do want to keep up with your weapons. Uh, usually I would recommend only being between five to 10 level or ranks off of like your player rank when it comes to your weapons. So like, let's say your player rank you know, 20, uh, I wouldn't be using a, a rank one or two sword. I would be trying to use something that's maybe rank you know 15 to somewhere near where I'm at in that situation. I mean, it isn't always perfect. You're not always going to have a situation where you're, you're going to be able to do that. I don't know the exact cutoff point where like an elemental weapon, like there's there basically are too many variables to tell you like, hey, look, in this specific situation, uh, if you're player rank 15 specifically and, and you have a rank 15 sword, right? Uh, a, a rank one weapon, even if it's the proper element, isn't going to be strong enough. It, there's other things that are going to be involved in that. I can't give you the exact answer, but just use your best judgment. You want to try to get as close as you possibly can with the right element. And that's pretty much what you're mostly worried about. Outside of that, when it comes to uh, secondary effects and things like that, as you can see, gear has special effects. You're not really worried too much about those special effects. If it's got extra attack, you know, if you have something that has a uh, um, attack up in general. Awesome. If you have something that has HP up in general. Awesome. You're not really worried about crit rate. You're not really worried about elemental weakness unless it matches the elemental of the actual weapon itself. That can be really useful. So, for example, let's say this fire sword had elemental weakness fire up. This would be really, really nice. So if you happen to come across that, that does you know, give a little bit more weight to that weapon. But it's something that you need to worry specifically about as you're going through this process. Just Grab a hold of the strongest weapon you can for the proper element. Also, EX elements are something that happen later on down the line. Don't worry too much about that. We'll talk about that at the second point. What you're going to have is mostly just this stuff here. So just go ahead and slap on whatever matches. Like, for example, if I'm fighting Trommel, which if you're leveling, most people are. Uh, if you're fighting Trommel like I am, you're going to use a lightning weapon and you're going to crush him. So just keep that in mind as, as time moves on. Also, it's worth mentioning uh, early on. If you're doing different missions, let's say you're playing with your friends and maybe you're further on than they are. And let's say you are rank 76 or 78 like I am and you're fighting trauma with your friends. Well, you can see that equipment rank restrictions is 50, meaning that no matter what you equip, it's going to be counted as being a rank 50 weapon. Uh, not that if you equip something lower, excuse me, let me rephrase that. No matter how high you equip something or how high of clearing something is that you equip, it's going to be counted as rank 50 if it is above 50. So. If you happen to have a weapon that's like 75, but it has like really, really terrible secondaries and you have a level 50 weapon that is you know, the proper element and has some decent secondary stats on it, the 50 weapon is going to be better because the level 75 weapon is going to be counted as 50 when you're in something like this boss raid. Just keep that in mind. Something to look at whenever you're looking at gear your characters. You want to make sure that if you are equipping gear, just being over level doesn't mean that you're automatically going to, you know, be overpowered for that quest. Granted, secondary stats are a big part of this and you still can be, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's how it works out to be. So as far as the early game, that's basically it. Grab accessories. You're good to go. Midway point uh, So we're going to come back to early game again in just a second here. So early gamers, hang on. We're going to talk about it at the end game because it's something that's actually kind of important. I'm not sure how to how to structure it. So I'm just going to put it at the end game portion with everything else because it just tends to be that way. Oh, maybe we'll, well, maybe we'll put it in the midway portion. We'll start putting it in the midway portion. Actually, it makes more sense there. So. We're at mid game, mid game where I would say is between like 50 to like 80, 90 ish is where you start to slow down as far as your EXP curve. I believe the EXP curve slows down at like 40, but it's like around the 50, uh, between like 50 and like 80 ish. You start to uh, slow down. You start to get more gear. Now you still want to still keep up with your gear for the most part. You want to keep up with your elemental weapons and things like that. When you reach the 70 bracket, you start to see weapons that have EX elements on them, you want to go for these because it's just higher percentage of the element and you're still matching elements as much as possible when it comes to weapons. And that's mostly it when it comes to your weapon. You're not really worried about anything else. You don't really want to try to build up your weapons too much because you're going to find a situation where you realistically aren't going to be able to keep that weapon for a super long period of time. Something's going to come along and be stronger just out of nowhere. And you don't want to lose out on that. You don't want to lose out on those resources that you built into a weapon and then you have this problem happen. So. How do we you know, efficiently build ourselves up? Now, if you're someone who happens to get lucky, right? Let's say, for example, you happen to get you know a decent pair of purple uh, swords that have a good effect on them. Like, let's say I take this attack up too. I turn this into a cube or I turn this into a sphere, right? 
and I'm like, you know what? I want to go ahead and I want to use this on something else. I want to use this on this rogue flare. Oh, sorry, Elucidator Rogue and Flare Repulsor. Well, you can. You can go ahead and slap it on here. And honestly, it's not a bad idea to have at least one effect on each of your weapons if you happen to have them, because you can always take that effect and crush the weapon for it. What I mean is like you're not really wasting any of your spheres if you only use one good sphere on a weapon. You can use some throwaway spheres if you happen to make some. It's totally fine. But if you only use one good sphere on a weapon, that's totally OK, because what you can do is later on, break that weapon down and get that sphere back. That same sphere you got that you put on it, you can break it down and get it back. However, you're not going to get back all the spheres you put on it. So just keep that in mind. As long as you only use one, it's OK as far as your weapons are concerned. And accessories kind of follow the same sort of thought process. So you can kind of carry over the same accessory. For example, if you happen to have like a crit rate level five or an attack level five, honestly, I would recommend keeping attack up level five so you can get a hold of them through your leveling process and then just slapping them on all of your weapons you plan on using that are of purple rarity and granted you're not always going to have a purple rarity weapon for that level but you'll be able to of course break that weapon down and take the sphere out and leave it aside yes it's going to cost you resources but you're going to need to level a lot you're going to have to go through a lot of content so you're going to get these resources back it's totally okay to do so but like i mentioned earlier you're mostly looking to stay on element as far as weapons are concerned that extra level of optimization isn't really required it's just a way that you can get a bit more damage without losing out on anything for the most part Moving on, we want to talk about accessories. Accessories are a bit of a weird spot because accessories only provide you base HP. And while that is very important, I'm not telling you base HP is not important. I'm not telling you to ignore base HP. I am telling you that base HP is only as important as you getting hit. You're going to get hit. Let's be for real. Everyone gets hit. However, it is a little less important than you being able to take down your enemy in a reasonable amount of time, especially if you're gearing, especially if you're farming, especially if you're just farming trommel specifically. Over time, you start to get into a rhythm where you don't really even need to think about, you know, dealing with some of his attacks. You're just that good at dealing with them incoming, whether it's you're blocking them, whether it's you're dodging them, whether it's you can just tank them and know that you're not going to die from them. You just start to get used to trommel and you know, farming him quite a bit. A lot of people are farming him consistently. He's just happened to be the optimal thing to farm. So base HP starts to become a little less important at this point of the game because you might just be farming one quest that you know the boss very, very well and don't need to worry so much about your defenses here. You can take advantage of that. So accessories provide you base HP. You can keep a pretty solid accessory. The only thing I would really recommend building is two things, two purple rings, one filled up with crit and the other one honestly filled up with elemental weakness damage up, not a specific elemental weakness, just elemental weakness damage up. The reason for this is because you're going to be able to use these rings in the late game. And while you're going to focus on your bracelet and your necklace, because those two are the more important legendaries, the ring legendaries are pretty bad. So you're going to want to have a purple ring anyway, because it's better to have four of these effects than it will be to have realistically any of the legendary ring effects at all. If you don't know what I'm talking about with the legendaries, you have one stat there, one uh, one specialized effect that you can't really move off onto another piece of gear. So when you're looking to build up your gear, you look for that one legendary that has the effect that you're looking for, and then you replace the three others. There isn't really a good one of those for rings, so you just want to take a purple ring and replace all four slots. Because legendaries don't have an extra slot, unfortunately. It'd be cool if they did. It'd be really awesome if they did. That means uh, rings would be a lot more useful, in my opinion, because you would just take the free extra effect and I feel like that's how it should work, but it doesn't, unfortunately. So purple rings are kind of the way to go, and I would recommend building it in the mid phase. You can also kind of keep to the same thought process that you did in early game, where you can just have each of your purple or yellow gear have like one decent roll on it that you want to go ahead and keep. And then you just carry that over as you're going up. But I feel like the ring slots OK to kind of keep it somewhere midway point and then just level up to like maybe let's say plus five or something along those lines. I haven't done that yet. I need to get that done, but it's okay to do something along those lines. You'll have the resources, you'll get them back. Realistically speaking, as you're leveling up, the only resource you really care about is coal. And it's just enough coal to be able to craft a hundred accessories every time before you log out. So you can cover your daily uh, accessory crafts. That's all you're really concerned about as far as resources are concerned. And that's pretty much it. And as long as you're playing pretty, you know, pretty consistently, you're going to have that coal. Like I haven't paid attention to my coal at all. And I've got 500 K. So, <laughs> and I have more than enough. This is me logging in. I could pop over to the store, right? Nope item right now and accessories and i can afford to create my hundred i haven't done anything today so as you can see you'll be perfectly fine don't worry too much about those resources there 
that's pretty much it for the midpoint just get EXs as much as you possibly can build up those two rings and then you can start to look for interesting legendary effects that you might want to work with some of your builds for example there's a specific one I think I have it set up on tank it has two combinations the necklace is pretty standard you're going to want this I mean I'm going to go for this as my primary necklace that I use on Kirito when I get him maxed out it's going to be use 5% HP to increase advanced skill damage by 30%. This is pretty easy for anyone to utilize. Uh, the only, actually, I don't, I can't think of a single character that wouldn't be able to utilize this okay uh, for damage. So pretty solid across the board, pretty powerful. There are other effects. This is like, if you only care about damage, that's what you're looking for. And then this other one here is why I build up a crit ring is skill cooldown on critical. So a really cool effect that you can actually utilize is when you use a skill, it goes on cooldown. This ring will help reset the cooldown of that skill. If you're only using one skill and there's only one skill on cooldown, it will continuously pump that skill cooldown on that one skill. It won't just go to them randomly. So this is going to be a good point to transition into our end game conversation of like builds and things of that sort. That's what I'm going to be building on Kirito is I'm going to get that ring, that ring specifically stacked up on crit. We're going to get elemental weapons. We're going to stack those on crit as well as much as we possibly can. And we're going to have that ring help us reset our cooldowns. But that's not just it. There's a couple of other things that kind of go along with building into end game. And we're going to get in the conversation of that end game build sort of setup. And this is where things can start to go a little wild. You can do different things. I'm going to talk about the build I'm going to go for and how I'm going to set it up. But realistically speaking, you can kind of go for whatever you really want. I would say the basis of most builds is going to be crit. However, you can go one of two ways, I believe, personally at this point in time. I believe you can go either full elemental, which is a weapon of the proper element stacked with elemental damage all the way across the board on the weapon. If it's a purple weapon, then, you know, for all four slots, elemental damage that matches that element. So, for example, if it's fire, elemental damage, increase fire all the way across the board and a ring that does the same thing. However, it is elemental weakness, not specifically the element. The reason for that is that way you don't have to have a ring for every element. Now, you can have a ring for every element if you really want to build one. That's totally fine. But I don't think that's a really good use of anyone's time. I feel like that's going to be really difficult to do for every single character or for every single uh, role. So I would say just have one specifically that is just elemental weakness damage and then have your weapons either have more elemental weakness damage or have them have uh, the element specific to the actual weapon itself that you're using. There's one setup, and that's that's one option. And then I would, of course, maybe put anti-roar, anti-stun, anti... Uh, poison's not that big of a deal, in my opinion, but anti-stun and anti-roar stun is really, really annoying. So I would definitely recommend having those somewhere. Uh, usually I toss it in my bracelet along with my, uh, my resistances. That's kind of what I go for there. And then... Something that you'll find that's actually really, really useful in my necklace, I put advanced skill cooldown level five, which is 10% and then EXP gain up. EXP gain up is really nice for boss fights where you're trying to get leveled up somewhat quickly. That way you have access to more skills for your character and being leveled up in the boss fight actually makes you do more damage quicker. So it's actually pretty helpful to have that extra bit of experience and it helps your party because your experience is shared to your party, whatever experience you get they get as well. It's based on you guys actually going on doing this together. So if all of you guys are running XP, XP gain up, it's going to make it much, much easier for you to get leveled up early on in boss fights, survive a bit better, and also do a bit more damage. Now, the reason I only have one advanced skill cooldown is because it caps at 10%. I don't know any other skill that caps, but this is the only one that we've been able to find that caps so far. People have tested this pretty extensively. 10% is the highest it'll go. So having this somewhere in your build is very, very useful. And yeah, 10% doesn't seem very high, but you'd be surprised how often this resets. It's really, really nice for making sure you're able to spam skills. And I mean, it's a bit RNG, but if you're paying attention, you can get quite a bit of damage out of it. Now, when you, you know, mix this along with the fact that we're going to go for a ring that is going to give us reduced cooldown on our skills, we're going to be focusing on one specific skill itself for damage. That means we only have one skill on cooldown. What you're going to end up going into is a situation where you have a character that spams one skill whenever they crit they reduce the cooldown of their skill they have a chance to automatically reset the cooldown of their skill and of course while they're critting they're dealing more damage of course you have the proper elements so you're doing more damage there it just works out really really well but there's more 
we can also take advantage of the fact we have passive skills. And if you watch my video where I talked about passive skills, I talked about what I thought were some of the strongest passive skills in the game. And for Kirito specifically, I'm going Guts Flight Master. The reason for it is Guts gives us 30% increased damage whenever we take damage. And if you remember beforehand, there is a necklace that sacrifices 5% of your HP to increase your advanced skill damage. Meaning that, and this is because of the way that this works in this game, when you sacrifice HP or when you use HP to increase damage or when you like basically anything that causes your HP to reduce counts as you taking damage, meaning it procs anything that requires you to take damage for it to be useful. So Klein's passive guts that I have on Kirito procs based on using that accessory. So we can stack this passive along with that accessory, along with the ability to help you reset our cooldowns consistently along with the ability that whenever we use a skill, we reduce our HP, which procs our path. You start to see how things compound on, on each other. So we end up going, turning into essentially a skill spamming machine. The cherry on top would be, we would want to search for a weapon that specifically has something like one of our skills charge extra damage. Fluxes aren't really great in my opinion. I feel like they kind of defeat the purpose of elemental like weapons because it changes the element to something else, unless it is a flux of that proper element, which some characters do have. I believe Argo has one. It kind of defeats the purpose, so I feel like it's a pretty terrible legendary effect in most cases, unless you're Argo or anyone who is like Argo. But other than that, realistically speaking, we can take advantage of more damage because right now I might be using Guts Flight Master, but at end game, when I get a proper set of swords that give me something like Charge Nightmare Rain, which has me charge the skill, I can take advantage of another passive. Now, granted, I don't have it just yet, but I'm working on unlocking it. If I can pull it up, where is she? Straya. Straya has the passive full charge. Full charge increases your damage dealt when you fully charge a skill. And funny enough, I don't, again, don't have it unfortunately, but Kirito has a legendary that has the effect charge nightmare rain that when you use nightmare rain, it counts as a fully charged skill. So now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be fully charging our Nightmare Rain for extra damage, which is going to cause us to sacrifice 5% of our HP, which is going to cause us to deal more damage, not only because we sacrificed 5% of our HP, but because of our Guts passive. And because we're using a charge skill, that also deals more damage. We also have increased crit, which is causing us to help us reset our skills, which we're only using one skill. So there's only one skill that can help you know bring the cooldown of. And we also have a 10% chance to reset that skill cooldown. So we just end up spamming our one skill over and over again, dealing as much damage as possible. And it's one of Kirito's strongest skills he has access to. This is what I love about building in Fractured Daydream. You can put all these different effects together and you end up with a pretty crazy build setup. Now, granted, I don't have it yet. Honestly, I could probably build it faster on my tank because I have more of the effects that I need than I do on my fighter. However, this is something you can put together and build and you can have a ton of fun with. This is only one possibility. Granted, I think it might be the strongest one, to be perfectly honest, but there are things like, you know, what I just described. You could do with something like Straya, who people have consistently said is the weakest tank in the game right now. You could do the same setup with Straya, to be perfectly honest. And with one of her legendaries that uh, I believe it, it causes her like tornado or whatever to uh, shoot out a bunch of uh, different attacks. You can get that to do insane amounts of damage for her while also just spamming her charged heavy attack over and over again to a gap close to your target and do massive amounts of damage. There, like the possibilities are, I wouldn't say limitless. There's of course a limit to them, but depending upon how you want to play, you could do some pretty crazy stuff. Maybe you want to go with more of a tank setup. And if that were the case, I would honestly rely more on elemental damage increase instead of critical. Cause I mean, critical we're only building because it's going to build into the fact we're resetting our skill cooldowns. If not, I would be building into elemental cause I believe elemental action ends up being stronger probably asking the question, are there any diminishing returns? As of right now, from what we've been able to find, no. Um, I haven't seen any diminishing returns whatsoever outside of that one advanced skill instant cooldown. Outside of that, that's pretty much been it. The only reason I would foresee a situation where you would want to use something like elemental more or crit rate more is because those specific buffs have access to more overall damage. You can get more critical damage in most situations than you can of just flat attack increase. There is, of course, attack up. Yes, absolutely. It's it's there, but it's in a lower quantity, right? Like you're only getting up to 5% per, per setup. And in a lot of quests, you can get more critical damage in one of those abilities you just grab a hold of 
than you're going to get in stacking a bunch of attack. Now, it's possible you could stack a bunch of attack and it could end up being very useful for you, but I just don't think that's going to be the route to go. Or maybe you're someone who likes to go more damage or defensive. If you decide to go defensive with like, say, your passives, build up elemental and utilize elemental damage where you can go with that instead of going with crit. Again, the sky, <laughs> this, it feels like the sky is limitless, right? It feels like the potential is all over the place. We can go up to some pretty crazy stuff. Now, there are some pretty bad setups, but I feel like there's some pretty awesome ones as well. And that's what I really enjoy about building in this game. We'll get there and I'm going to do proper build videos for a lot of different characters for all my different setups. I'm not going to do a build video for everyone, obviously, because some characters are just going to be running the same thing. But overall, I feel like it's going to be a lot of fun once we do get built up in Fractured Daydream. Hopefully it helps you guys out. I know it's a lot to talk about. I know I went through it rather quickly. I do know I speak kind of fast. I do apologize. I actively have to try to slow myself down so, so much. So if you notice any weird pausing or just like me stopping for a second, it's because I'm aware of it. I do this all the time. So if you're new here, apologies, you'll get used to it eventually. As some of my fans have said, just set the video to like 0.5 or 0.75 and you're perfectly fine in most situations. My voice is already deep enough as it is. It usually doesn't bother most people. Either way, let me know if there's anything I missed in the comments below. Let me know if I mixed up anything. And if you guys happen to have any really awesome resources for building, build building for uh, for videos or for information on the game itself, feel free to join our Discord. We share tons of information in the SAO channel. So love to see you guys there. Either way, like if you enjoyed the video. So if you want to keep up with more, as always, thank you to the channel members. I appreciate every single one of you. Love your faces. And we'll see you all in the next one. Take care, my friends. Peace out.